Nearly 60 years ago, in the freezing cold sea off the North Cape of Norway, the Allies' Arctic convoys were under attack by the German Navy. As a result, these waters were the scene of some of the most desperate naval battles of the Second World War. Today, the Norwegian Navy is scanning the seabed using the latest underwater detection equipment. They are looking for the most famous casualty of the Arctic battles, the Scharnhorst, one of the most powerful German warships ever engaged by the Royal Navy. The whole wreck is lying upside down. If this wreck, seen here underwater for the very first time, is the Scharnhorst, it would be one of the most important underwater discoveries in the aftermath of the Second World War. Not least because the official records say that the ship shouldn't be here at all. She was one of the most beautiful warships ever built. We always said that the Scharnhorst was a lucky ship because she was unsinkable. I was never afraid. She was unsinkable. Capable of doing 33 knots at full speed, she could outrun most of her opponents. Time and again during the Second World War, the battlecruiser Scharnhorst would strike and then throw off any pursuers. A myth was created. The Scharnhorst is invincible. Yet in December 1943, 24 hours after leaving her base in northern Norway to attack an Allied convoy, she was sunk with the loss of nearly 2,000 men somewhere off the North Cape. But just why this state-of-the-art warship sank as quickly as she did has never been fully explained. And there's another mystery. In 1943, Admiral Fraser, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Home Fleet, reported that the Scharnhorst had sunk in a position some 80 miles to the northeast of the North Cape. Yet almost 60 years later, during an underwater survey of the area, a Norwegian diving vessel made an astonishing discovery. We've been searching in the area about uh, 10 square kilometers, and there is no indication of any wreck. As the search is widened, there's still no sign of the Scharnhorst. There's a gale blowing from the northeast with heavy seas. We had to break off the search this morning. The weather had become too bad to use the side scan sonar. We've examined the official position thoroughly. The wreck's not there, that's absolutely clear. To help solve the mysteries, the former Norwegian Rear Admiral Kjell Pritz was sent to London by the Norwegian Navy, which had participated in the battle on the Allied side. The Admiral's task is to do research at the Imperial War Museum and the Public Record Office. He finds that the official records are contradictory. The position of the Scharnhorst sinking reported in the logbook of HMS Duke of York is different from the official position reported by Admiral Fraser. The distance between the two positions is 13.3 nautical miles. Also in London, on the River Thames, is HMS Belfast, now a museum. But in 1943, the Belfast was the flagship of the cruiser squadron during the Battle of the North Cape. In the ship's command center, the original plot for the battle is on display. 
and one of the men who fought the battle sheds light on how the contradiction between the given positions might have occurred. So, so you were on the escort of Duke of York? Yes, the uh, Scorpion. Yes. And we were on the um, starboard or south side of the yes. Duke of York on the yes. east run. I was the Navy officer, but uh, of course the navigation was uh, of the force was done in a very bad westerly gale. First three or four hours it was prepped was following sea and we had an awful job to steer any course at all. I mean we were jiggling around trying to keep station on it. We wouldn't have been totally lost. Really I wouldn't like to say we knew within 10 miles of where we were. The bad weather and the Arctic darkness might explain the vastly differing positions given for the Scharnhorst sinking. but how to find the correct location of the wreck. Perhaps an examination of the ship's history and tactics could provide a clue. The Scharnhorst, with her heavy armor and considerable firepower, was the pride of the German Navy. As a surface raider, the battlecruiser, with her superior speed, was a widely feared ship. During campaigns in the Atlantic and Norwegian seas in the early years of the war, she sank the armed merchant cruiser Rowell Pindy, the aircraft carrier Glorious, and two destroyers. Operating together with her sister ship, the Gneisenau, and with other German units, more than 20 Allied ships were sent to the bottom of the sea. A dangerous new threat to the Allied convoys to the Soviet Union was created when in March 1943 the Scharnhorst joined the battleship Tirpitz and the rest of the German battle group in their new naval base close to the North Cape. An operation, codenamed Venus, was set in motion by British intelligence in an attempt to combat the German warships. Three agents, equipped with radio transmitters, were landed by submarine on the northern coast of occupied Norway. Their mission? To infiltrate the German naval base and report back to London any movements made by the German fleet. Using a false ID, one of the agents, the Norwegian Torsten Rabi, set up his radio transmitter within the perimeter of the German base. He was helped by a local, Harry Pettersen, who lived in a house that had a direct view of the German anchorage. The radio transmitter was hidden in the barracks belonging to the local roads authority on the other side of the village. It was under the floorboards. The rule was, don't get caught alive. Save the last bullet for yourself. That was the order. Towards Christmas 1943, the agents observed increasing activity among the Germans. At seven o'clock in the evening on Christmas Day, the Scharnhorst and her five escorts put to sea. Our contact in Langfjord called me when the Scharn horse left. Ostensibly, he called to wish me a happy Christmas and asked if I planned to stay at home. Yes, I said, and he continued, so will I, but grandmother just left for her holidays. That was the alarm. We had to get the message off to London. The signal from the Norwegian agents that warned London of the Scharnhorst's departure has never been acknowledged in official history, nor can the message be found amongst the officially released records. But our research has revealed a British intelligence document which confirms that the Norwegian agents on the 23rd of December had asked London to tune into their frequency every other hour. 
The agents had obviously sent this earlier message so that any signals concerning the Scharnhorst's imminent departure would immediately be picked up by London. However, the agents inside the German base weren't the only source of information available to British intelligence. At Bletchley Park, they had by now broken the code of the Enigma machine, which allowed them to read the German radio traffic. All this secret intelligence enabled the Allies to set a trap for the Germans. Two convoys, one laden with supplies from Scotland, another returning empty from Russia, had been sent out. The returning convoy was covered by three cruisers under the command of Vice Admiral Burnett. And to the west, near Iceland, the British home fleet was ready to strike should the Scharnhorst be tempted to attack the convoys. The Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Bruce Fraser, on board his flagship, the battleship HMS Duke of York, awaited confirmation that the Scharnhorst had taken the bait and left her secure base. Um the 24th of December, we sailed out. Uh, we went ahead of the Duke of York and then four destroyers were on behind. Christmas Day was normal Christmas Day. The only thing about Christmas Day was the fact that we were steaming in about 27 knots. Just seven hours after the Scharnhorst's departure, Admiral Fraser got the signal he had been waiting for. And then it was Boxing Day morning when uh, the pipe went, do you hear there, do you hear there? This is the commander speaking. Uh, I've just received a signal from the CNC to say that the Sharnos is at sea. Uh, uh, action stations will be piped in five minutes. We picked up a signal from one of the escorting cruisers, which were with the convoy. We were not with the convoy, we were some distance from the convoy at the time. Um, oh. no, uh, yeah. no, yeah. Sixty years later, in an attempt to trace more accurately the final position of the Scharnhorst, the battle is reenacted in virtual reality at the Norwegian Naval War Academy in Bergen. The Academy's powerful computers can simulate any battle situation so long as the initial data is correct. The starting point taken for the reenactment is the confirmed position of HMS Duke of York at noon on Boxing Day 1943. The first ship that spotted the Sharnos and was in action with her was the Norfolk. She spotted the Sharnos and the Sharnos was after the convoy. So the, the Norfolk tackled the Sharnos by herself. Well, she hit the Scharnhorst and the Scharnhorst is hurt. And then I went up to 38 meters up. So I climbed up there, 38 meters up in the air on the main mast. I put on my headphones and communicated that I was at my post. We had a platform close to the top, the 10 meter rangefinder and the radar. The first lucky shot from the English dropped through the tower where the two men were sitting. The shell exploded, killing one man. The other one lost his leg, and the radar was destroyed. The battle, fought in darkness, wasn't filmed, but other archive of many of the vessels involved does exist. The Scharnhorst had attacked the convoys to the north, and indeed had uh, done so twice, and on each occasion had been driven off. And then we knew that we really were going to be in business. In the increasing gale, the accompanying German destroyers had difficulty maintaining speed. After another skirmish with the British cruisers at midday, the battle group's commander, Admiral Bai, called off the attempt to attack the convoys and ordered the destroyers to make their own way home. 
The Scharnhorst was now on her own, and she was effectively blind as she had already lost her radar. As she headed back for her base in Norway, the Scharnhorst was being shadowed by the Royal Navy's cruisers. And from the west, the Duke of York was racing in. In Bergen, the simulation has started. The data fed into the computers have transformed the simulator into a replica of the bridge of the flagship HMS Duke of York. Although the images of the warships generated by the computers are those of modern vessels, the simulator is being fed with performance data of the Duke of York and the real weather data for Boxing Day 1943. It is late afternoon. On board the Duke of York, they now have the unsuspecting Scharnhorst within their firing range. And the Commander-in-Chief, Sir Bruce Fraser, had uh, already decided that unless the enemy opened fire first, he would hold fire until the range came down to 12,000 yards, six miles. And orders uh, came down, uh, all guns with armor piercing and full charge, load, load, load. You were there loaded, ready, and as soon as the gunner officer said shoot, he pressed the trigger, and then all guns would fire together in a broadside. What was that? Immense pillars of water that reached higher than I stood. I was drenched. We were hit in my compartment while I was above the panzer deck. All my comrades were torn apart, except one. I can't describe it. The Scharnhorst had turned away and made off for her Norwegian base and it was then apparent that she had the legs of us uh, in the weather conditions prevailing. The range started to open. It still went on firing, so he was still in with the chance, but it went on opening. The enemy was just quietly walking away from him. The Scharnhorst started to zigzag, twisting and winding as we tried to escape, and we nearly made it. You couldn't escape the feeling. Uh, that the enemy is getting away, and he was. And there was nothing you could do about it. You knew that we couldn't go any faster, and he was actually escaping. I looked at the instruments to see how fast we were sailing. It was still reading 33 knots. Then one of the boilers closed down. We had three boiler rooms. One of them was hit. Uh, quite suddenly, the range steadied. And then the range counter started to tick down. And it was like almost uh, awakening from a bad dream. Uh, you realize that if it went on like that, you were catching him up and you were then in with a chance. Our speed dropped from 33 to 28 knots. The engineers pressed the engines to full power, but remember, the sea was very rough. Well, it was really uh, almost a repeat of uh, the initial opening fire at the start of the action. Uh, of course, by this time, the guns had remained loaded, and all you had to do was to order the fire to be opened again, 
And that's what happened. Es war alles dunkel. Es war keine Beleuchtung mehr da. So stark war die Schutzung. It was dark. Es war alles ausgeführt. There were no lights because of the explosions. Nur einer noch. Und dieser Kamerad, das Only one man was still alive. He was burning from top to toe. His hair burnt like a torch. The simulation of the battle has helped to pinpoint four spots where the Scharnhorst was likely to have been caught and disabled. With further clues provided by fishing vessels, the search team has chosen new search areas, far from the official position. The Battle of the North Cape may have taken place further to the north than historians currently believe. Armed with the data from the Naval Academy simulation, the team put to sea. Hammerfest Havnevakt, Hammerfest Havnevakt, Hoysveidrup, Hoysveidrup, vi går fra Kaja. Through the cooperation with the Norwegian Navy, the team have been allowed the use of an oceanographic research vessel. Normally used by Western navies for detailed mapping of the seabed in the Barents Sea, the Sverdrup is equipped with state-of-the-art sonar and computer systems. The ship's echo sounder transmits 111 narrow sound beams into the ocean depths. En route to map the seabed of the eastern Barents Sea earlier that summer, the Sverdrup has already sailed through the search areas and discovered a number of echoes. She now goes directly for the most promising target. Here we have a card over the priority road out of Nordkapanken, which is a possibility for that Sharnos can live. We are going to make a En box på 600 meter rundt target nummer 5. Så vi får bare krysse fingrene og håpe at vi finner noe. To get the best data from the sonar, the temperature, salinity and density of the water at the bottom of the sea are all measured. At the target area, the sonar's sound waves provide a picture of the seabed, which, far below the ship, is in total darkness. In the sonar picture, one large object can be seen raised above the level of the surrounding seabed. Uansett, hvis det er det vi ser etter, så ser den veldig, veldig medtatt ut i hvert fall. Men kan den ligge med kjølen i været? Så ser du ikke noe ut. Fullt mulig at den sank med kjølen i været. Et drak av en sånn størrelse som ikke andre drak du kjenner i denne området. Vi har estimatet den lengden av det til approximately 170-180 meter. And uh, what we believe is the bow is laying down here, and it estimated it to be about 60 meter long, uh, length. So what we see on the picture here, at least for me, is that this is not no no facet so. So I'm not sure that there's nothing distinct. But no one lives there. At the North Cape, the search team has been transferred to the Royal Norwegian Navy diving vessel KNM Tier. It is equipped with a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, capable of diving to more than 1,000 meters. The sonar search may have produced the image of a large object on the seabed. But only with the help of the ROV's two underwater cameras will the search team be able to try and identify the mysterious object hundreds of meters below. So we see it now, that we move us langs the one side first, and then eventually flyt us over to the other side. The problem is that the ROV-kabel has not set itself fast in the brake on one or another way.
On the bridge of the tier, the search team watch as the operator uses the ROV's cameras and sensitive sonar array to carefully maneuver the vehicle towards the mysterious object 298 meters below the surface. Hans Olav? Okay, a little longer than the west. A little longer than the west. Can you go in for that and see if you can? Här är ju en del, en brakdel som ligger runt fraken. Vi ser på sonaren nu på brakdel här. Det är små, små delar som kommer här och vi är nu en 24 meter från här och vän. Har ni en lavett? Ja, det är 28. Vi går in i stön. Look at the, see if we can find the tree propeller. Right. Där är propellen nu. Där är propellen. Har den tre blå? Nej, inte. Det ser ut som så små ut i propellen igen, men... Den, ja. Ja, det, det där är inte en handflåte propeller i alla fall. Nej, det är en high speed... Det är en high speed propell. Det är en marinepropell. Ja, du, du ser på sånn så ser du propellen. Så är det med propellen på baksidan. Där är det igen. Så hvis du trekker det litt mer venstre ut. Ser det ut som det er en torpedokanon? Ja, det er en torpedokanon. Det ligger en torpedo i, ikke det? Jo, hvis du gjør det det. Det ligger to torpedoer i. Det ligger to torpedoer i, ja. Nei, de stakk torpedoer igjen. Vi prøvde å stikke av i stedet for å slåss, vet du. Ja. Vi er kjøring beside. The port side, I think, and uh, port side, have, yeah. the, have, will be the, uh, have the torpedo, which were beside of the ship. There's a red cannon. There's a red cannon, yeah. Now we'll see you up on deck. Now we'll pick up back over. It looks like it's 10 cm. Yeah, I'm going to say that. Yeah, but 10,5 cm was doubled here, but now it's 15 cm secondary cannon, right to the side of the torpedo. It's 10,5 cm. Inside there, you'll have a 10,5 cm. Yeah. The wreck is indeed the Scharnhorst, found several miles from the position given in the logbook of the Duke of York. From these first underwater images, it is immediately apparent that the Scharnhorst must have suffered catastrophic damage during her very last moments, something the eyewitnesses of the time confirm. All the destroyers were ordered to go up and prepare to attack the enemy with torpedoes. And Eventually we caught her up and got ahead of her and the, um, our part of the battle started. We're now turning around and we're going in at full speed to torpedo the Shanas. Well, everybody knew, you, you know, you've got to get with them at least a quarter of a mile to make sure you get a good head. So everybody said the prayers. We went in for about a quarter of a mile. Uh, the Norwegian stored a bit near there because I thought she was going to tie up to the Sharnos. We were in the port 800 meters and we scouted eight torpedoes. We fired eight torpedoes at 1800 meters. Then the ship ahead of us turned to starboard and we followed. He put out a smoke screen and we drove straight into it. The Scharnhorst fired into the smoke screen, but no one was hit. And uh, when we got into about 5,000 yards, we could then see her coming straight at us. She was bows on. The range was closing very rapidly, and it was obviously she had turned towards us but fortunately, she's turned away. She turned to starboard and presented her port beam so that we were able... I think it actually, by the time we got into about 2,000 yards, um, we had a good shot at her with torpedoes, almost a perfect shot. And then I hear, heard I hear in the ear. Through my headphones, I heard the sound of torpedoes. We tried to turn, but what was going on? Were these our guns firing, or torpedoes hitting us? We could actually see 
actually see the uh, damage that was being caused on the uh, Sharon Horst. I mean, fires everywhere and explosions and one thing and another. It was the CNC on board the Duke of York said, uh, I think somewhere region about, I think about just after seven o'clock at night, asked for the Jamaica to go in and finish her off. Of course, the next thing is that uh, we are illuminated with uh, the Sharon on Star shells. Uh, and you think, we're lit up, we're lit up. She's bound to see us, she's bound to see us. Well, we were fortunate we weren't hit, direct hit. We were, we were very fortunate. After all them torpedoes, she has to have two more put in her. And she still wouldn't sink. She was still firing. So, but she was stopped in the water. She couldn't go anywhere. The Duke of York was still having a go at her. We closed right in, right in, uh, to point blank range. Right into the, the coup de grace, as it were. And you could see that um, the target was on fire from end to end. During the, all that time, the guns of, uh, of Sharnhorse were, were still firing right to the last. You could see her ship's company jumping over the side, uh, silhouetted against the flames, and of course, they stood no chance in those waters, which was a horrible sight. One felt uh, faintly sad, enormous relief that it was all over, and successfully over. Faintly sad, because this very fine ship, and she was a very fine ship, um, had been completely blown out of the water. We were all of the same mind. We had to stick together. We had to win whatever, to, whatever happened. And as I say, our hearts have mellowed now, but in wartime, those hearts are hardened. It was their ship, wasn't it? You know, their pride. Their pride and joy. And after the home fleet had finished with her, she was at the bottom of the sea, bottom of the barren sea. Og da ser du at nå ligger altså fordekken, ligger det helt nede i mudret. Det vil si at hvis kanonene fremdeles var der, så er de nede i mudret. Dette ligger for siden av vraket, altså. Ja. En leder. Det er en type der en del av overbygget som blir dratt av. Leider opp til brovingen der, eller sånt som vi så det. Kanskje en av brovingene som rett og slett har slått av. Hvor er skroget som holder det? Det er granater. Dette er ammunisjonshilser. Ja. Det er et ammunisjonsdepot. Da kan det være et beredskapskasse, altså. Det er ikke svære de der, da. Er det det? De er store. Det er nok 28 centimeter, dette her. Ja. Vi ser ladede ammunisjonshilser. De er fulle av krutt. Men det som også er litt interessant er at skroget er jo i prinsippet vekk fra bildet vårt nå, da. Ja. This is the end of the main hull. Dramatically broken off. Det er i hvert fall ikke noe særlig tvil, tror jeg, om at det er foran det har skjedd de store dramatiske tingene som har vært eh, finalen. Etter sonar-ekkoet så skal han ha en knekk på seg noe øyeblikket. Ja. Det for meg ser ut som det er en voldsom kaos her nå. Ja. 60 meters of the Scharnhorst foreship has completely disintegrated and lies as a twisted heap of scrap metal at an angle to the main hull. Even her 32 centimeter Krupp armor has been blown to pieces. Large parts of her superstructure have been ripped off and strewn across the seabed. The half mast, is it? Yeah, so we, uh, I think so, yeah. That's the only place you actually have oh. a lookout position. Look out. Look out, Barry. Look out, Look out, Barry. 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 Look out, Det er bauen. Det er bauen, ja. Her er bauen og anker. Her er det anker. Her er vi bauen. 
It's an anchor. We don't see yet whether it's a bow anchor or, or a poop anchor. Look up, up, up to see what, what's the rest of the top. What's that? Uh, the coil. Uh, I'm not yeah. convinced it's the bow yet. Vi bare finner ut hvis vi får bestemt av hvor dekket er en dekke. Her er det en dekke, må jo... Her er dekket, hva? Nå går ned på dekket nå. Det er et dekk. Ja. Ja. Nearly 60 years after she was sunk, the mystery of the Scharnhorst's final resting place has been solved. But there remains one last question. Exactly what was it that sent her to the bottom of the sea so very suddenly? The Norwegian experts analyze the underwater pictures to try and find out. The rudder, maybe. Yes, that's the rudder. Yeah. That is a rudder. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, two rudders. Yeah, that's that's yeah. not a rudder. Yeah. We have. A it has been hit by a very. Yeah, that's cut off. Strong yeah. force yeah. torpedo. That's that's cut off. Simply cut off. Yes. She, is, she has been hit by two torpedoes at least in the propulsion of the region. She it has been broken here, just uh, it's the uh, stern of the uh, yes. rudder. Yeah. Broken there. <coughs> well, this didn't sink her. <laughs> well, stopped her. It stopped her. Yeah. That's a torpedo hit, yes. The search team never found the bow. They found the stern having been ripped off and deposited on the seabed 120 meters from the wreck. With 21 watertight compartments and strong armor shielding, she was designed to withstand 14 torpedo hits. 55 torpedoes were fired at the Scharnhorst during the last 90 minutes of the battle, 11 hits claimed. The survey proves that the Scharnhorst sank so quickly because one or more of the torpedoes triggered a massive explosion that destroyed everything in front of her bridge. The front of the ship doesn't exist anymore. No ship could survive such a disaster, not even the lucky Scharnhorst. That's what, uh, what made it yes. happen so fast. Yes. We always said that the Scharnhorst was a lucky ship because she was unsinkable. And we said, we will be up here in northern Norway while they're celebrating victory in Germany. They've forgotten all about us, and we'll return home as old men with thick beards. But the Scharnhorst for me was unsinkable. I was never afraid. <laughs> 